So walking is fundamental, but I've argued in my, in my research that running is also really fundamental and an important part of, of physical activity and that we evolved to run millions of years ago in order to hunt. Um, but yet a lot of people are very worried about running and they're wary of running because it's because there's this kind of general kind of consensus out there or, or, or idea out there that running is bad for your knees. And, and again, there's some truth to this, right? Running, run, all the physical activity, all exercises cause a risk of injury. There's no, there's no magic bullet. There's no way to exercise without, you know, without essentially, you know, risking some injury. And it is also true that, that the knee is the most common site of injury. But it's also not true that uh, all kinds of knee injuries are caused by running. So there's been many, many prospective randomized control studies which show that running, for example, does not cause arthritis. And in fact, there's actually growing evidence that running may actually help prevent uh, arthritis because it may actually help you strengthen the cartilage uh, in your knees. Although once you have arthritis and you try to run, that's gonna exacerbate it. So, so that is a problem. And, and one of the things I argue in the book is that running is a skill just like a lot of other physical activities, just like swimming and, and you know, climbing a tree or playing tennis or, or whatever. You know, it's not just something you just know how to do, you have to learn how to do it properly. And for, furthermore, you need, the body needs to adapt to the stresses caused by running, which are of course greater than those by walking. And the aerobic system uh, uh, d responds to the stresses of running more rapidly than the musculoskeletal system. So one of the problems with, with adapting to running is that you can run farther than your body can actually tolerate. And that's how people get into, 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 bad, into, into trouble. But also I think there are better ways and worse ways to run. And again, I'll discuss that in the book, but, but there are a lot of people don't know how to run and they overstride and they lean and they do all kinds of things, which adds extra stress uh, to their bodies, which make them more likely uh, to be injured. And then the final section on endurance, the final chapter on endurance is I think maybe for me, the, most, the part of the book I'm most passionate about, which is, which is the importance of exercise as we age. So we, in my culture, you know, on this side of the pond, you know, people think that retirement is the time to move down to Florida and kick up your feet and kind of relax and, you know, take it easy. But obviously we never evolved to retire and hunter-gatherers um, um, don't have any retirement at all. Now, if, if you if one of those people who thinks that hunter-gatherers die young and that, and that only recently we live, evolved to live long, that's actually not true. Hunter-gatherers, if they, if they survive childhood and they survive the first few years of life, actually typically live into their seventh decade. Um, it's actually after the advent of farming that people started uh, dying at a younger age at, at much higher rates. Um, but importantly, and so, so humans actually turn out to be one of the few creatures that live past, uh, in, in the wild, that live past uh, the age of reproduction. And this is, and, and it's been shown that one of, one of the major reasons for that is what's called the grandparent hypothesis, which is that hunter-gatherer grandparents actually work really hard uh, foraging and hunting and digging up tubers and all those other sorts of things, which they to generate a surplus, which they then feed to their to their to their children and their grandchildren. This is a, a study of, of hunter gatherers in Africa showing that uh, kids don't spend that much time per day foraging, but mothers spend about two to five hours a day foraging, but grandmothers can spend four to eight hours foraging. So those grandmothers are actually spending more time than mothers foraging, thereby to getting a surplus, which then they, they feed. So I would argue that we evolved to be not just grandparents, but we evolved to be active grandparents. And that, that, that the physical activity that occurs, especially as we get older, is really important in activating repair and maintenance mechanisms that, that, pro, that prolong life and slow aging and keep us healthy. And, and I go into enormous detail about all those different kinds of repair and maintenance mechanisms. So, so it's not normal to be less active as we age. It's actually more normal to be, to be more active as we age and to stay active up, up until, up until uh, the end. Which brings us to the final section of the book, which is about how do we apply all of these, these sort of natural, his, this natural historical, evolutionary, and anthropological perspective to health in the modern world. And again, I want to sort of do that in the, in the, in the, in the context of some myths. So, so one myth is just that you should just, just do it, right? So the, the kind of today's Western approach to, to physical activity is that we, we've commercialized it. So you spend money on it and you go to buy gyms, et cetera. And I'm not opposed to any of those sorts of things, but because that's the way our world works. But we also medicalize it. We, we advertise exercise as medicine and we prescribe it. But of course, those are all very modern approaches. And, and as I said before, the reason people were physically active in the past was, was for two major reasons. One was it was necessary and you needed to do it in order to survive. 
And the other reason that they were active was when it was social, it was fun, it was, it was rewarding. And I believe that if we're gonna to try to help each other exercise, clearly commercializing and medicalizing exercise has not really succeeded very much because as I said before, only 20% of Americans managed to get, you know, managed to do 20, 20 minutes a day of physical activity. Uh, we're clearly failing to do that for all kinds of interesting reasons. And I think that if we wanna, we wanna be more successful, we find we need to try some alternative approaches and, and, and to kind of uh, to make a long story short, I argue that we should treat exercise much the way we treat uh, we, we, we treat education. We should make it necessary and also social and fun. Another myth about exercise is that there's an optimal dose and type of exercise and you can buy all kinds of books which tell you exactly what to do. Um, but it turns out that that's another kind of myth, right? It's, it's, it's complicated. Um, this is a, a graph of a huge study. This is over a million Americans. And this is dose of exercise in terms of the minutes per week of moderate to vigorous physical activity on the x-axis against the relative risk of death, all right? And this is adjusted for age on the y-axis. And you can see that people who aren't very active um, have much higher rates of, 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 of dying in a given year. And as soon as you start exercising just a little bit, your rates plunge about 40%. And at 150 minutes a week, there's an average about a 50% reduction in the relative rate of death. But as you can see, that number, that, that risk continues to go down and then it evens off as you, get, as, as you get to higher levels of physical activity. So there's nothing special about the 150 minutes. It just happens to be something that we've kind of sort of all converged on as a good minimum because it, it lowers the relative risk uh, by, about, by about 50%. And the real answer to this question is that, that some exercise is better than none. More is better, but the benefits diminish. And then there's a real interesting debate about whether or not there, too much exercise can be bad for you. It turns out that little blip at the end, these are people, by the way, exercising 30 hours a week, which is a ridiculous amount of exercise. And that's actually not a statistically significant increase. So there's, a, there's an interesting debate about whether or not you can exercise too much. Most of us think that's probably the case. There's actually not a lot of evidence um, to support that. And then finally, the final myth of the book is that exercise is a magic bullet against disease. Now, now please understand me. I don't want to get this, uh, you mis to misunderstand what I'm thinking, but it really is true. And I go through all of these diseases in the book, Ex obesity and heart disease and respiratory tract infections and cancers and Alzheimer's and diabetes and arthritis, osteoporosis, as well as some mental health conditions like anxiety and depression. And exercise really, really does lower the risk of many of these common diseases. And I and each, and I, the, the last such chapter of the book is really a kind of a compendium. It's almost like an, an appendix and you can look up various kinds of diseases and, and see what the evidence is. But the important point about that is not that exercise really is medicine, but rather it's that the absence of regular physical activity increases our vulnerability to these diseases. And in fact, these diseases, many of them are what we call mismatch diseases, not, not entirely, but partly. And, and a mismatch disease is a disease that that we're more likely and we're more vulnerable and more, uh, it's more severe uh, in, uh, to us in, in modern conditions, right? So we're more likely to get them because we're physically inactive. So we didn't evolve to exercise to, to prevent heart disease. It's rather, we never evolved not to be physically active. And so the absence of physical activity increases our risk of heart disease. And that's an important distinction. And understanding that distinction helps us understand how and why physical activity is so important uh, for, for health and disease. So really, to conclude, I hope that, um, that, that you get a chance to, to look at the book. And my, my goal is to, is to entertain and enlighten, not to make it a kind of a tedious, horrible subject. I hope that I'll change the way you think about exercise in particular, and, and also the science of health in general, because I think we've oversimplified, and we've, 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 there's too much bias, and it's too commercialized, it's too medicalized. We're very judgmental and incompassionate. You know, people who are told that that somehow there's something wrong with them because they don't like to exercise. Well, they're just, they're just being normal. It's normal not to exercise. It's very abnormal to exercise. Um, it's normal to want to avoid ex unnecessary exertion. And then finally, I hope that the book is useful. Um, I hope that, uh, that an evolutionary and anthropological perspective can help you um, and help people uh, think, of, think of new ways to make exercise fun and necessary in the modern world, and also help people understand how and why exercise can be healthy and rewarding without being being judgmental and 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 you know and and um, and so too value laden, but most fervently, I really hope that um, that you um, you get to enjoy uh, what you how you use your body and not be exercised about it. So, I, I'd be happy to answer any questions in this very strange, non-interactive 
world. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lieberman. That was really fascinating. And um, yeah, the book is called Exercised and can be found in all good bookshops and online. Um, and of course, the, uh, a link to this presentation will be sent out to everybody so they can look back at the slides and look at all the myths. Um, and that will be sent to your inbox in the next uh, couple of days. Um, so don't forget to um, send your questions to the Q&A function. We've got some already. And I will just, uh, I just want to announce to the audience that uh, Professor Lieberman ran his 25th marathon yesterday, um, the Boston Marathon. Um, and it was the 10th time that you did it. Is that right? I didn't ask you how long it took you, but um, was it one of your better ones or? No, it was, um, it was kind of hard to run a marathon with no crowds and no cheering and no, no excitement from a race. So I just kind of went out and had fun and I, I ran a 337, which is, you know. That's not amazing, a amazing. So congratulations on that. Uh, so we do have some questions in already. Uh, so I'll just go through a few of them. Uh, what is your opinion on intermittent fasting? Is it a fad or is it something really beneficial for your health? Oh, I love this question because I'm really interested in this. Um, so intermittent fasting, there's, there's, a, there's a growing evidence that it's, um, it's, it's beneficial. But again, think about it from an evolutionary perspective, right? We didn't evolve to be able to eat all the time. And, um, and you know, people, you know, we're, we're, you know, whenever we're hungry, we just run down to a you know, machine and get some food or run to the kitchen or the refrigerator or whatever. And, and, and that keeps insulin levels high and that has all kinds of negative effects on our health. Um, but interestingly enough, I think some of the mechanisms by which intermittent fasting um, is healthy um, turn out to be so, some of the, many of the same mechanisms by which physical activity uh, is healthy. Uh, but it's a subset, and, and that's because it's, a, it's an energetic stress. When, you're, when you go through periods of negative energy balance, which is really what energetic intermittent fasting is, you, you, you have, you're, you're using up energy from your body, that's called negative energy balance, that, that activates various kinds of of, of, of metabolic and cellular responses that turn out to be kind of slightly stressful in a health, in a beneficial way. And when you go out for a jog or a run, you do the same thing, but you do it in a kind of a more acute fashion. And so I think, and this is a hypothesis, but I think a lot of the benefits from intermittent fasting are also, are actually kind of a subset of the benefits of the energetic stress of physical activity. And, and, they're, and they're activating the same mechanisms and so I think they're kind of two sides of the same coin. I think they're, and, and so there's growing evidence that, 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 that both are good for you. Um, but, but there's also, I think, you know, if, if you look at the, the, the kind of list of benefits of energetic, of intermittent fasting versus physical activity, there are way more benefits of physical activity than intermittent fasting. You're better off, you know, you know not, 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 you know, cramming food into your mouth all the time, but, but it's not a substitute for, for, for exercise. It's so nice after compliment. your marathon, after your, marathon, after your marathon, how hungry were you? Because, <laughs> or what did you eat? Um, oh, you actually, lost a lot, used a lot uh, of after a marathon, I tend not to be very hungry for a while because there's sort of some appetite suppression. So I didn't eat really anything for a while. I had maybe a, I don't know, I had a, I had a, I had a milk, I had, a, I had a, some chocolate milk, which is a great recovery drink. And then my tradition uh, is that we always go out for Chinese food after a marathon. It's the best recovery food ever. That's good to know. <laughs> Um, Karen asks, I know that being healthy, eating activity assists with cancer prevention, but do you know any specific physical activity, type or amount that has been proven to reduce cancer or cancer recurrence? Mm. Oh, it's a really important question. Uh, thanks for asking that. So um, uh, there's a whole section on cancer in the book. And so there's evidence that physical activity is good for some cancers, not all of them. It's particularly uh, important for breast cancer, uh, for colon cancer, some others, um, and um, and there's not really a huge amount of dose response data on on that. So it's really hard to say, you know, just quite what, you know, to what what a recommended dose would be. Um, but but there's no question that um, cancer that there, the benefits come from you know reducing glucose levels, from from reducing hormone levels. So people who are more physically active don't produce abnormally high levels, for example, of estrogen and progesterone, which can increase the risk of breast cancer. Um, there, there are probably a variety of interesting mechanisms that improve uh, your, you know, decrease your vulnerability to colon cancer. So by some estimates, physical, you know, people who are physically active reduce their colon cancer risk by 60%. At some estimates, not all. And breast cancer reductions are between estimates between 30 and 50%. But I think 
in pretty much all the studies, it's really aerobic activity that's really most important. So cardio. And, and again, I'm not sure there's any number anybody can put on it, but you know, some is better than none and probably more is a little bit better and then the benefits tail off. But I don't think anybody can really put a, a solid number on it. And, and, um, and, and you know, that's just the way things are. Everybody's a little bit different and there's no simple answer to any of these questions, but it's a great question. Um, what sort of activity is deemed exercise under the 150 minute weekly minimum in the States out of interest? Oh, we kind of maybe crossed. Well, but no, that's a good question. So that's, that's generally moderate to vigorous physical activities. That's when you get your heart rate above, above about 50% of its maximum. So, you know, brisk walking would be considered exercise, swimming, dancing, you know, pretty much all, all kinds of things would be considered exercise, but it's a slightly, you know, it's a slightly artificial definition. Um, and I think, um, you know, I don't, yoga is also an exercise and, you know, um, a, a modest rock is all, you know, it's a, it's a continuum, right? So, um, you know, what we, again, it's part of the medicalized way we think of exercise. We kind of come up with a precise definition, just like if, you're, if your blood pressure is 131, you're hypertensive. And if your blood pressure is 129, you're not. I mean, these are kind of arbitrary. And, um, and again, you know, some is better than none and more is a little bit better usually, but it, there's no simple, you know, that's part of the problem with, 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 with the way which we approach exercise. By trying to put simple numbers on things, we, we end up, or simple sort of categorical definitions, we end up, mm. uh, you know, twisting ourselves in knots sometimes. So is there a specific type of exercise for older people or, uh, you know, how does age impact the type of exercise that we do? Great question. So as you get older, exercise, of course, as I, as I argued, is really important as you age. And, I, and, and the evidence is that as you get older, weight-bearing exercise becomes relatively more important. Because one of the big problems with aging is, is a disease called sarcopenia or muscle wasting. Um, and muscle wasting really decreases your functional capacity, you know, the ability to get out of a chair, for example, or, or you know, just to do various functional tasks. So, so uh, I, I showed a little video of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, our wonderful Supreme Court Justice. You know, she's been going to the gym and working out, et cetera. Really important for aging. Um, but, but also cardio is important for, for, for as you age too, that prevents, for example, hypertension and, and a wide range of other diseases. So really it's a mix, right? Um, it's a mix of cardio and weights. But as you get older, the weights become relatively more important. And you don't want to miss out on the weights. You want to add that to the cardio. Um. Are you able to explain again what you mean by mismatch diseases? Oh, I'd love to. That's really the, the, the topic of my, of my last book, The Story of the Human Body. So a mismatch disease is a disease that's, that's more severe or more common, more prevalent, because our bodies are inadequately or imperfectly adapted to the modern world. So think about, you know, all diseases are a result of gene-environment interactions. You have a bunch of genes you inherit, and, you, and those genes live in, a, in an environment, a world, right? What the food you eat, the things you do, the, what your parents say to you, all those sort of stuff affects your, 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 you. And, but genes change slowly. Every generation they can change very slowly, but environments change really rapidly. I just think about the changes in our environments in the last few generations with, with the internet and, and you know, transportation and, and food and all that sort of stuff. So our bodies aren't necessarily well adapted to some of those changes. And so, for example, Diets really high in, in refined sugar and low in, 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 in fiber, which used to be almost non-existent, right? Unless you occasionally had honey, right? That's about it, right? Uh, those, those make us sick, right? Um, in, in excess quantities. Um, another set of mismatch diseases are the ones caused by physical inactivity, because until recently, nobody was able to be physically inactive. We just never, you know, we were evolved to, to, um, to, um, to sort of cope with physical inactivity. Um, too much salt, I mean, Smoking, that's another, you know, lung cancer is another mismatch disease. There, there are many of them. I would argue that flat feet is a, is a mismatch disease caused by, by having uh, weak feet from, from shoes that allow our feet to become weak. So, so the, the world is, you know, it turns out that most of the diseases that we, we suffer from, the chronic disabling diseases we suffer from, and quite a number of the infectious diseases, the contagious diseases that we suffer from, turn out to be mismatched diseases. So they're really important. And that's, that's an, a powerful example of how and why an evolutionary approach, I think, is really necessary as a complement to, to, to modern medicine. You know, ignoring evolution in medicine has, been, um, has not been uh, to our advantage.